Yes, as you all may know, SpongeBob SquarePants has fallen from grace ever since the movie. And by fall from grace, we mean jump out of a plane with a piano strapped to its back. At first, it may be hard to see everything wrong with the show if you're still looking at it with rose-colored glasses. But if you can take them off for a moment, you'll quickly see just how awful this show has gotten. Many people have made top 20 worst episodes lists to talk about how bad the show has become. But since we want to be more original, we're just going to talk about the worst overall traits that plague the series. There's not much else to say, so let's get to it. Back in the early days, Sandy served as the female lead, and we'll be honest, she was probably the least memorable. Don't get us wrong, we're not saying her character was bad. She just had the least impact on us out of all of the characters. That being said, she was still a well-thought-out character. She was strong-willed, loyal to her friends, and had a love for mid-southern culture. Then the new season started, and the writers decided it would be far more interesting if they scrapped all that and just made her a science nut. Guess what? It didn't. It just made her even more forgettable. Part of why this is such a problem is because it's hard to see where this change even came from. I mean, sure, it was made clear that she had an appreciation for science, what with her tree dome and water suit, but nowadays, she's completely obsessed. Rather than her personality or her southern background driving the plot of an episode, most of the time, it's one of her odd experiments or inventions. This is the result of an experimental growth serum I developed. It could easily feed a lot of hungry people. <gasps> Once the testing is complete, the growth serum could be used to do a lot of good things. She went from being the unique female take on the SpongeBob universe to just being a ripoff of Jimmy Neutron. Not even a good one. Another major simplification they made was her being superior to SpongeBob in karate. Why? Back in our top 20 best episodes list, we talked about karate choppers and how much fun the karate sequences were to watch. One of the reasons why they were so great was because Spongebob and Sandy were evenly matched, so it was hard to predict what the outcome would be. The only time in the older seasons when Spongebob was inferior was in No Weenies Allowed, and that was really just to set up how much of a weenie he is. What? But I'm not a weenie! Yes, you are. In Karate Island, it was clear that they wanted to make the change to go for a female empowerment message, but it failed miserably. Sandy was actually a better message for gender equality back when she had her actual personality, but with that one, she just turns into a hollow shell. Did I already show you my single-wheeled roller skates? Or my helicopter that's powered by coconut milk? Huh? Oh yeah, that sounds interesting, Sandy, but uh... It no longer resembles actual equality, but it more resembles gender dominance. Sandy's changes were probably the least bad of all of the characters, but they were by no means good. But hey, at least she sticks to a good moral scientific code, right? This here's a psychological test to see how much weird gunk folks will eat. If it's free! The overly detailed animation. Now, we're not referring to the animation itself, because if there's one thing the new seasons do better than the old ones, it's the animation. Back in season one, the animators had to rely on a cheap and dull cell animation style. They were able to get some cleaner animation in seasons two and three, but the animation of the show truly reached its peak in the later seasons. No, we're more referring to the overly detailed faces of the characters. There are two ways this affects the show, and one of them is with the side characters. The animators seem to think that if they give the side characters a ton of facial detail, it'll make them more memorable. It doesn't. Design doesn't create character, character creates character. The reason why this hurts the show is because they waste the detail on just throwaway characters. And sometimes they decide that still isn't enough and give them weird ways of speaking. Just look at this twit from Extreme Spots who just shows up to- Extreme Spots are the direct byproduct of the most extreme spots. Oh dear lord, what is that? The number one practitioners of extreme spots. That's not a British accent, that's Homestar Runner trying to badly impersonate a British accent. Those are the drastic radicals. Is that the pool of students? It's so odd that they would put so much detail into the designs of the characters that aren't incredibly important to the story because they don't even seem to serve a purpose. But at least this isn't as bad as the other way this affects the show, which is... Well, remember this famous moment from Just One Bite? Does this look unsure to you? We all knew it was funny, and the writers did too. And if something was funny the first time, it has to be even funnier the 52nd time, and now with even more grotesque detail. 
The reason why this extreme close-up gag worked the first few times was because the grossest features the faces had were just wrinkles. Oh, and they were only done once or twice. Now they're done at least five times a season. Assuming that's the exact average, there have been 20 times we've gotten a face as awful as this. Or this. Or this. Extreme close-up! It's probably not that exact amount, but you get the idea. So remember this, parents who may be watching, every time you let your kid watch this show unintended, you run the risk of letting them see something like this. <coughs> After running for a bit, many TV shows end up creating plot formulas when episodes have similar setups, and the fans sometimes use them to identify the type of episode. We have episodes that focus on one specific character, look at an ongoing plot from a different perspective, or are sometimes just used for setup purposes. SpongeBob SquarePants had this sort of thing as well. There were several episodes where Plankton attempts to get the Patty formula, or where SpongeBob goes to boating school, and so on. Now you may be thinking, hey, I didn't click on this video to get a lecture in writing, I wanted to hear you talk about why you hate this show. Don't worry, we're about to get back on track here. You see, plot formulas first became popular among writers The punchline is reusing the plot. But I wanted to educate the masses. Well then maybe you should have become a teacher. And live in a cardboard box. Good point. Plot recycling is one of the most surefire signs that a show is starting to age. Since it's been going on for a while, it begins to run out of ideas and opportunities, and decides to take previous plot elements and reuse them, with only a few moderate changes to the formula. It works like this. The plot formula is the type of scenario that is occurring in the show's universe, and the plot elements are the characters, events, and jokes that make it unique. A lot of things don't work as well the more they're used, and plot elements are one of these things. Here's an example. The episode Krusty Dogs has Spongebob encourage a major change in the Krusty Krab, and it gets so popular that Krabby Patties become obsolete. The breaking point comes when his grill and spatula get taken away, and he decides to undo the change. And you just heard half the plot of Bossy Boots. Another example of this is Stitchin'. Now, I want you to tell me if this sounds familiar. When Spongebob is encouraged by Patrick to skip his- That's hooky. Just hear me out, okay? He's reluctant at first, but soon enjoys his new freedom more as- That's hooky. I'm almost done. When he sees the dangerous consequences that come from breaking the rules for some minor fun, he tries to head back to where he needs to be, only for a lethal accident to- That's hooky. Of course it's hooky! How could anyone not see that it's hooky? Moving on... This has gotten so bad that Spongebob Squarepants has actually started recycling plot elements from the modern, crappier episodes. The Season 7 episode, Someone's in the Kitchen with Sandy, which we'll be coming back to later, has Plankton disguising himself as Sandy to convince Spongebob to give him the Krabby Patty formula. This episode is already a ripoff of Imitation Crabs, but there's more. Later on in the season, there's an episode called Grandma's Secret Recipe, where Plankton disguises himself as Spongebob's grandma in order to steal the Patty formula. Then there's also the episode Shellback Shenanigans, where Plankton disguises himself as Gary to get Spongebob to give him the formula. Then there's the episode where he disguises himself as JonTron to try to get the formula. Um, that never happened. Would it surprise you if it did? Basically, reusing plot elements is a lazy way of trying to extend the show's lifespan, but it can only get you so far. Since the show is so popular, though, it probably won't end until we've gotten at least two of each episode. By my calculations, that means the show will stay alive for... let's see... Carry the Pie... What? 35 seasons. Wow. That's depressing. Reusing plot points might be bad, but using nothing at all is even worse. What we mean by that is, while plot recycling might be lazy, it's still not as lazy as just cramming in a bunch of unimportant junk to fill up the runtime. Unfortunately, this is what shows up more often. This is another clear sign that a show is running out of ideas. Filler often happens when an episode is moving along too quickly, and the writers decide to put in the show equivalent of a filibuster in order to make it last longer. Occasionally, they might try to disguise it as an important plot point in order to keep your attention, but filler can easily be identified with these questions. 1. Does it really affect the plot afterwards? 2. Do the characters learn anything new and important? 3. Is it at least funny? If the answer to all of them is no, then you've successfully identified a filler moment! One of the most infamous examples of these is the main drain. It starts off with Spongebob working as we've already seen him do in previous episodes, until Mr. Krabs starts telling a story about a cataclysmic drain for no good reason. 
SpongeBob and Patrick then decide to look for it to protect it from people who might want to unplug it and bring doom to all. Even though it apparently already happened, so everyone's already doomed, or maybe Krabs is just off his rocker, but then again, they actually do find the drains, so maybe everyone just had a bunch of Phoenix Downs. Look, the, the plot makes no sense, okay? The point is, they try to talk to Plankton and someone claiming to be Old Man Jenkins about the drain, but Plankton just tells them what they already know, and Old Man Imposter knows nothing. Then we watch Spongebob and Patrick arguing about the best way to travel for a bit, and only then does the journey actually begin. It lasts for just a couple seconds before they find the drain. Now, think about how much more interesting the writers could have made the journey in the seven or eight minutes that they wasted. They could have had Spongebob and Patrick travel to the ends of the sea, overcoming perilous obstacles and getting more and more nervous as the threat of the drain being unplugged looms closer. Instead, we have restaurant work, time-wasting rambling, and pointless bickering. Another example is the infamous Spongebob, you're fired. Well, what happened? I think I just blew out my anger inhibitor. Well, well here, ha have a drink. No. I want to do this. Take it easy, then. <sighs> this whole episode feels like it was human centipeded from the concepts of more interesting episodes. Unfortunately, none of them are interesting here. It starts off with Spongebob just making some Krabby Patties, which already kills off two minutes of the episode's time. Once Mr. Krabs fires Spongebob for reasons that we'll get into later, Spongebob starts crying for almost one and a half minutes straight. Mr. Krabs says he can cook well enough to take over Spongebob's role, disregarding the fact that he can't cook, and then we have Spongebob feeding Gary for the purpose of adding nothing to the story. Spongebob then cries for a bit more, he's joined by Patrick, and then Patrick tries to cheer him up by showing him the fun of being unemployed. Fox News makes everyone facepalm again, and then we have several minutes of Patrick trying to cheer Spongebob up, but he remains grumpy. This is the one place where the scenes of Spongebob having fun during Ditchin' could have worked, but the activities aren't even fun or funny. Sandy eventually suggests for Spongebob to find a new job, and then we see that everything he tries to make just ends up being a burger. Four times in a row. Wow! How original! Spongebob goes home to feed Gary and ends up making amazing snail food. This is pointless, and Spongebob gets kidnapped immediately after. The four restaurants fight over him a bit, until a patty mascot comes and defeats most of them. Here, take him! This don't hurt me! <laughs> <sighs> okay, I'll fully admit that joke could have worked had it been happening to Ian Hecox. Now you're sure Mildred will be there, right? SpongeBob gets rehired and then everything goes back to normal. None of this was ever important. The purpose of entertainment is to entertain. Filler not only wastes valuable time that could be spent doing interesting things, but it also loses the attention of the audience. If your art medium has filler that becomes way too obvious, that's a sure sign that you need to either start over or scrap the concept entirely. Remember when the only stupid characters were Patrick and maybe Spongebob? Those were the good old days. Nowadays, you'd swear to God that everyone in the show was exposed to the orb of confusion for too long. Let's face it, people enjoy laughing at a fool, but no one enjoys having to constantly put up with a lot of fools. In the old days, all of the characters were well-written and well-balanced, each one having different qualities and areas of wisdom. Now those areas of wisdom seem to be the only things they know about. As for everything else, they couldn't know or care less. So there you have it, Mr. Krabs. Sandy really needs our help. Okay. Explain it to me again. But this time, take out anything that doesn't have to do with money. You are truly the greatest hide-and-seek player in the whole world! Wasting a Krabby Patty? How could you? I'm full. The characters may have lacked common sense in some areas, but they still had brains. The whole purpose of having a stupid character is to create a comic foil for the smarter characters to react to. That's all fine and good, but having everyone be stupid just gets really irritating. Especially since there's no smart characters left to call them out or bring an element of sanity back to the group. And it's fine if the characters are just flawed or have some quirks to them. But having everyone be stupid basically means that they're the same character with just a different reason why they're stupid. Much like number 9, this even applies to some of the background characters. In Little Yellow Book, they were unable to realize that they were at fault along with Squirtle in one of the most irritating scenes of hypocrisy ever. Chumbucket Supreme showed that they were stupid enough to put their own lives at risk, and Greasy Buffoons was pretty much the same thing, except 
grocer. Damn, you are stuffed. Me too. But that deluxe Krabby Patty was so slim and good. I'm gonna get another one. Wait, doesn't that sound like Cactar from Final Fantasy Gill Quest? No. Ultra Chubby Patties packed with quadruple grilled goodness. The most we can buy with the money we made is a gumball. Oh, and tell me, how many times have you heard this stupid joke used? As time quickly runs out, still no word from the imperiled oil girl and SpongeBob. Oh no! I'm out of coral on a stick! This is terrible! Oh, are you hurt? Oh, well, thank you for asking. I wasn't talking to you! Don't worry, Papa's here. Gary! Ah! You put Buffy down right now! Bad boy Gary! Bad! We get it! They're stupid! It's not funny! The bottom line is that there's an age-old question. Who's more foolish? The fool or the fool who follows him? As interesting as that question might be, it's now kind of hard to tell which one is which. I must admit, my curiosity is piqued. I guess I'm piqued to peek at that book. Okay, no! Since the show is called SpongeBob SquarePants, it of course revolves mostly around him. He gets the most screen time, most of the plots affect him in one way or another, and he's the most iconic of the cast. So that means that when he got flanderized, we had to deal with his problems the most. Much like the show itself, there are still traces of what he used to be. He's still an excellent fry cook, he still cares about his friends, or at least he pretends to, and he still enjoys jellyfishing. He's also become incredibly irritating. Oh, please! Come over for a visit, Squidward! I'm stop my toe! Ah! Uh... Yeah, that's the kind of behavior I'd sooner expect from a spoiled child. It doesn't get any better when he's happy, either. Another day, another nickel! Wow, he'd take any joke as a lame excuse to laugh obnoxiously. Are you... gay? Guilty! I'm driving over to the show, I'm driving, I'm driving safely, I'm obeying the rules of the road. I'm sleeping. Or am I? Okay, so he's still got some standards. The main cause of these problems is that the writers have made him too much like a child. He definitely had childlike qualities to him in the old seasons, but it was carefully balanced with hints of maturity and even wisdom. None of that really comes up anymore. When he's not acting ignorant or cheerful to an obnoxious degree, he's acting like a toddler. Again, he wasn't always mature in the older episodes, but the writers knew when to let his maturity shine through. Remember when he was ready to face the consequences for his actions in Karate Choppers? Or how he rallied together the townspeople with an aspiring speech in Band Geeks? There's nothing really like that from the newer seasons, where his adult side takes charge. There's one more big problem that we want to touch on, though we'll expand on it later. His friendliness towards Squidward was always apparent, but it's become downright psychotic. You always knew back then that he wanted Squidward to be his friend, but now you'd swear that he wanted him to be his... Well, take a look at this and tell us what you think. This is horrible! I have my clarinet recital tomorrow! Oh, it's not so bad, Squidward. Now we can be best buddies and do everything together. Forever! At best, it's this. Do you not trust the feelings of the flesh? And at worst, it's this. Ugh, I just want to burrow into you like a love tick. I want us to be one person, two hearts inside one skin. <gasps> That's it! Oh no. In the old days, Mr. Krabs represented the best and worst sides of many business owners. He was greedy, yelled too much, and didn't learn as much as he should have, but he also cared about his employees greatly and would do a lot to thank them for what they've done. Nowadays, he represents business owners from a more realistic point of view. He cares about money and nothing else. It was always true that Mr. Krabs took his love for money a little too far, but he still had standards and a moral compass. Neither of those are still noticeable nowadays, so for all we know, he could have just sold them to make a quick buck. And that would have been one of the less awful things he's done for money. It's gone beyond just making money his major concern. He's now willing to steal, lie, cheat, and do whatever else was portrayed in The Wolf of Wall Street. 
Local resident watches poll. No one's gonna pay to read this malarkey. Maybe instead of man watches poll, you could say something like, oh, man marries poll. Now, one could say that this isn't out of character, since he sold SpongeBob's soul for just 62 cents and born again crabs. Well, if that makes all of this not out of character, why did this happen? Look, Squidward, money! Mr. Krabs, I can't believe I'm saying this, but how could you trade SpongeBob for 62 cents? He stuck up for you and you sold him out? You should be ashamed of yourself! What have I done? <laughs> yes, it did take Squidward's scoldings to make him realize his error, but Mr. Krabs still ended up regretting what he did. Now, even when other characters try to tell him what he did was wrong, he doesn't care. In fact, he doesn't even get any consequences for it most of the time. You lifted the entire hotel room? Stop! Exaggerated. That is the stingiest display I have ever seen. I declare you the new winner! Ah, stealing's just a minor annoyance, am I right? I mean, why else would I be able to hold this binder full of the CIA's important Okay, they finally let us out of Guantanamo. That was an unpleasant experience. Yeah. I'm still not really sure why they arrested me, though. Now, where were we? One of the most infamous examples of Mr. Krause's obnoxious greed is Plankton's regular. In this episode, Plankton finds a customer that actually enjoys his food, and starts visiting him regularly. Mr. Krabs, instead of being relieved that Plankton will no longer try to steal his formula because of this, wants to steal the customer away from Plankton. Because as we all know, one customer is the most ultra-important concern in a business. He even resorts to stealing the formula to try to outdo Plankton, and this is when we're convinced that Mr. Krabs is actually the villain of the show. It turns out that the customer didn't actually like Plankton's food, and Mr. Krabs tastes a disturbing amount of joy in his despair. Another example would be, again, Spongebob, you're fired. What was that? My anger inhibitor just melted down. Go on, get it out of your system. As the title suggests, Mr. Krabs fires Spongebob. Why? Well... It turns out that I'll save a whole nickel if I cut your salary. Completely. A nickel. A nickel! Ignoring the fact that this is incredibly illogical and that getting rid of his best employee would actually be a detriment to his business, this writing is just lazy. There are tons of better reasons for Mr. Krabs to fire Spongebob. Maybe he accidentally causes a dangerous accident that Mr. Krabs fires him for. Or maybe Mr. Krabs would want him to make something else of his life instead of just working at a fast food place. Or maybe the Krusty Krab is destroyed in a crazy disaster. But no. We get a nickel. Do you feel better? A little, but not much. Here. Here's some change. Go buy yourself a click bar at a vending machine. <sighs> Thanks. I'll, I'll definitely try to... What's wrong? A nickel! Patrick. Just... Patrick. It really goes to show how far from grace the show has fallen when the previously best character has become the absolute worst. He originally was Spongebob's best friend, a bumbling buffoon who always wanted to help his friends and spend time being happy. Now, not only does it feel like someone took out his brain, but his heart as well. Patrick has been described as many things by former fans. He's been called an asshole, a jerk, a smartass, and a monster. But I believe there is only one word that can truly describe in full what he's become. Bully. Patrick is a bully in every sense of the word. He abandons his friends, argues and whines just to prove a point, steals from them, and even mocks them viciously. None of it makes you laugh or chortle or even crack a smile, you just want to scream at him to shut up. Yeah, cook me up a Krabby Patty with good old Fifi. SHUT UP! It's very true that there are different ways of not being smart, and one way could be not knowing how to act in a socially acceptable way. But there's a difference between not knowing what you should and shouldn't say, and just being a dick. Recently, it's become commonly said that Patrick's only two portrayals in newer episodes seems to be as either an uppity prick or as a brain-dead retard. Neither of them is pleasant to watch, nor do they even resemble Patrick from the old days. 
We just explained why his jerkish side doesn't work, but what about his idiot side? What about it is so different from the older days of his stupidity? Well, in the old days, Patrick's stupidity was usually just used for jokes or minor plot development. Even when his stupidity occurred at the expense of someone else, you not only got the impression that he didn't really mean it, but it was never a detriment to them outside of just being a minor annoyance. Wow, you guys are good! I'm the last person I would have suspected, but I was looking for a mate all the time! It's the perfect crime! Wow, I'm being arrested! Hey, that's what we said when we went to Gitmo! Don't, don't remind me. Nowadays, Patrick's stupidity is often used as a blatant plot device, a thinly veiled way to move the plot forward. Not only is it often out of nowhere, but he suffers no consequences when it ends up hurting his friends. It gets even worse when he keeps talking like nothing is wrong, as if he never did anything at all. I would like two extra cheesy nachos with a side of cheese. Shut up! One of the worst examples is the card. Spongebob repeatedly tries to get an ultra-rare Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy trading card, but he never finds it. Patrick gets it, and the rest of the episode is spent showing Patrick putting himself and the card into danger, on purpose by the way, and Spongebob has to constantly bail him out. Sure, eventually Patrick says he can have the card at the end of the day, but until then he starts maiming and destroying it for no good reason, right in front of Spongebob. And when the card is finally destroyed and Spongebob starts crying, Patrick reveals he actually had four more of the same card. Patrick, where did you get these? Well, that one pack I bought was filled with them. Dearly, dearly, doop, doop, doop. Another example is yours, mine, and mine. Spongebob buys Patrick a Krabby Kitty meal, saying that he can share it. Patrick proceeds to eat it all, and then whines that it didn't come with a toy. Mr. Krabs makes one, and so Spongebob can have it for a little more money. Spongebob buys it and is overjoyed. Then Patrick insists Spongebob share it and... I want you to watch this footage and, and some clips from the older seasons back to back. Am I interrupting? Oh, hey Patrick, have you met my new toy? Don't you mean our new toy? Where does he work? What the wusty web? <laughs> <laughs> Remember, sharing is the most wonderful feeling in the world! Wait, 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 Patrick, stop! It's me, Spongebob! Nice try, burglar! But Spongebob's my best friend, and he'd never steal from me! Kinda hard to watch, isn't it? And believe it or not, it actually gets worse. Patrick takes the toy and keeps it for the entire day and night. Spongebob asks for it the next day, and Patrick still won't give it to him. Then we see that the episode thinks both Spongebob and Patrick are at fault here, and that makes it even more unbearable. Patrick eats it to be a jerk, and Mr. Krabs scolds both of them for some reason. He then reveals that he made a whole bunch of toys because they were popular, and says they can both have one as long as they can pay for it. The episode ends on one of the most infuriating moments ever. This time it's on me! Patrick, that's my money! Have you learned nothing about sharing? Can you see why we hate him so much? Hate? What, what do you mean? Hate. Let's briefly talk about how much I've come to hate Patrick ever since the new seasons began. At this point in time, my videos have gotten over 2 million views across all of them ever since I've started my YouTube career. If the word hate was, say, scrawled on the foreheads of every single solitary person that even clicked on one of my videos, it would still not come close to representing one billionth of the hatred I feel for Patrick right now. Hate, hate, hate. Oh, speaking of which, I'm almost at 2 million views. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. So, we don't like him very much. You can't take it! It's not fair! Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up! Almost done. <laughs> My eye! <laughs> the Squidward torture porns. Half of you already knew that this was going to be on this list at some point, and the other half doesn't know what we're talking about. For those of you who think we're talking about some disturbing stuff on the internet that, sadly enough, probably exists, we'll try to explain. A torture porn is a genre of media that, like the typical porn, lacks any substance or artistic value. 
However, instead of having copious amounts of sex, a torture porn has copious amounts of pain and suffering. As far as we can tell, the phrase Squidward Torture Porn was first coined by Mobro Studios in his Top 20 Worst Episodes list, and it quickly caught on. Mainly because it was a perfect description of what most of the modern episodes center around Squidward are. Unpleasant and unfunny episodes that mostly focus on Squidward being miserable. Now, some would argue that it was funny when it happened to Squidward in the older seasons, so that makes it funny here. However, we don't consider those to be Squidward torture porns. I call those Squidward karma trips. In episodes like The Idiot Box and Club Spongebob, it was a matter of justice occurring because Squidward was acting like a jerk, and it was satisfying to see him get comeuppance for his sour attitude. This was even more true in episodes like The Lost Mattress and The Camping Episode, where the punishment often happened because Squidward's attempts to be a jerk to others backfired. But in the modern episodes, he's not really a jerk at all. He's more of an average person just trying to get on with his life. Even if you don't care for Squidward as a character, and are perfectly fine with all the torment he's receiving, first of all, you're a sick person. Stay on topic. Fine. Even if it doesn't matter to you much, you still won't enjoy these episodes. Why? They're so boring. Outside of all the torment Squidward is going through, not much happens to them, nor are there that many jokes. So it doesn't matter who you are. At best, you'll be bored, and at worst, you'll feel angry and sad. Especially since the ones tormenting Squidward often don't get punished for it. And that's a real shame, since one of them is often... Patrick. <laughs> SHUT UP! Everyone has a different idea of what the ultimate Squidward torture porn is, but I think one of the worst out there is Cephalopod Lodge. It shows that Squidward has found happiness within a secret club of squids, so naturally Spongebob and Patrick show up and ruin it for him. We see how depressed he is by it, so Spongebob and Patrick decide to cheer him up by abusing him even more. Eventually, they try to get him back in by dressing up as a giant eel to attack the Lodge members and having him pretend to save everybody. And it actually works! Until they stab him in the back by revealing themselves too early. Another infamous example is Tentacle Vision, where Squidward decides to get his own TV show. About what, you ask? We never find out, since everyone starts barging in and stealing it from him one minute at a time. Yes, everyone. Not just SpongeBob and Patrick. You see, it's gotten to the point where the writers need to torment Squidward have led them to writing in whatever contrived stuff they need in order to make it happen. Even when Squidward outright yells at everyone to leave him alone, more people just end up coming in, and this all leads to an incredibly insulting ending where Squidward loses control of his house. Poor Squidward. He used to be a lovable jerk who got what he deserved, but now he's an identifiable everyman who's always beaten down by the world. Look, we're not asking for much here. We just want an episode where the abuse towards Squidward is justified. Um, l let me rephrase that. We want an episode where the abuse towards Squidward is justified that isn't that. The number one on this list is not only the biggest and worst problem on this show, but it's also a direct cause of a few of the problems here. So before we get to it, let's recap. Number 10, Sandy's Simplification. Number 9. Yours is a face only a mother could love, and one I could never forget. Number 8, Plot Recycling. Number 7. Cause this is filler, Number 6. Everybody's an idiot except for me. Number 5, SpongeBob's Flanderization. Number 4, a nickel. Number 3. Shut up! And number 2, the STPs. One of the reasons why Spongebob Squarepants caught on so well with kids was because it seemed like a very friendly universe to them. The kids wanted to believe that they could find Bikini Bottom so that they could go jellyfishing, say hi to Patrick, or even dance with him, karate spar with Sandy, see Squidward getting a tan, or even eat a Krabby Patty while foiling Plankton's plan. But if the show's modern day portrayal is what's supposed to be accurate, this is the last place I'd want to hang out as a kid. Why? Because Bikini Bottom is no longer the creative, happy place it used to be. It's now a cesspool of hatred and evil. Yeah, I'd have that same reaction if I was living there for so long. Not only is everyone a jerk, but more often than not, people who wrong others get off scot-free while the innocent get blamed. I don't know what kind of kid would want to hang out in a messed up place like this. This is, without a doubt, one of the meanest shows I've ever seen. Yes, its harsh tone even rivals the tones of shows like The Walking Dead and Battlestar Galactica. Why? This show seems to have a certain level of arrogance to it. It seems to think that it's still the bright chipper show it once was, and it doesn't even notice how cruel it's become. 
Not even a little. A big example of this is someone's in the kitchen with Sandy. Plankton steals Sandy's fur to disguise himself as her and tricks Spongebob. And while that's happening, Sandy is trying to find the person who stole her fur. And we get this. Seen anybody in these parts hauling a fur pelt? <laughs> Look at a naked chipmunk! <laughs> Look, a hairless goat! <laughs> okay, ignoring the fact that no, she isn't naked, and yes, there are fish who are even more indecently exposed than Sandy, where the heck is this coming from? She's asking a question to find a criminal, and she's just greeted with the people mocking her. Granted, this probably doesn't happen a lot, but the townspeople all instantly becoming jerks is incredibly unwarranted, not to mention out of character. I mean, can you imagine any of them being jerks like this in, say, pre-hibernation week, where they all help to look for Spongebob for days on end? Oh, and Sandy gets arrested for public nudity even though she just apprehended Plankton, aka the real criminal here, so the law enforcement is just as mean and biased as everyone else. Another example? Gone. It starts with Spongebob waking up to find a few of his friends missing, and eventually realizes that everyone is, as the title would suggest, gone. This episode is just borderline meh for the most of it, and it kind of got clever when it alluded to Christine. Then it instantly became infamous when the ending came around. As it turns out, everyone left Bikini Bottom for a cute little event called National No Spongebob Day. It was National No Spongebob Day! Oh, I think you need to hear that one one more time. It was National No Spongebob Day! That's right, National No Spongebob Day, where everyone leaves Spongebob alone to worry about if his friends are okay while they burn a giant wicker man of him. Wow, not even Squidward would have done that in the old seasons. But somehow, they got everyone in Bikini Bottom involved in it. Yes, everyone, including Mr. Krabs, Sandy, and even Patrick. You too, Patrick? <laughs> yeah, everybody needs at least one day away from... <laughs> this sort of tone may work in other, more serious shows, but that's because they've established themselves as places where that sort of dark stuff happens. This is supposed to be a show of child-friendly humor and happiness, not The Departed. It comes across as incredibly jarring, not to mention kind of creepy. If you think about it, a lot of kids shows try to introduce kids into life by giving them characters and role models to think about and keep in mind when they act, not to mention satirized versions of how the world works to help them understand life a bit. It doesn't feel anymore like the show is trying to satirize anything or create interesting characters. It just feels like it's shoving cruelty in our faces because it thinks it's funny. It isn't, and it's not good to show kids, especially when the show still thinks it's trying to give them good morals and likable characters. If kids think this is similar to how morality works, and yes, that is an if, this show is not only bad, but potentially dangerous. And I know what you're thinking. Kids know better than this. They know this isn't real life. Maybe, but kids are very impressionable, and they get a lot of their lessons and influences from things like this. And if the show presents itself in a way similar to other shows that teach better lessons and morals, it's easy for them to not see the cruel undertones of this show. And even if you're an adult watching this who knows how life works and doesn't need any lessons, you'll be incredibly offended. How? Well, let's touch upon One Course Meal, one of the worst episodes ever. Mr. Krabs finds out that Plankton's afraid of whales after a failed attempt at stealing the formula, and disguises himself as Pearl to stalk and harass Plankton for days on end. It gets to the point where Plankton attempts to kill himself by waiting for a bus to run over him. A Am I reading a police report? I mean, I I've seen this episode a couple times, but I, I still can't get over this. I wish all of us could get over it. SpongeBob sees this, and after telling Plankton he can't hurry his death because of his good nature, he starts having doubts in Mr. Krabs. He tells him of how far Plankton's despair has reached, and Mr. Krabs becomes shocked and disgusted with what he's become. He finally realizes the monster that he's turned into and calls Plankton, desperate to apologize. In a surprising and actually heartwarming turn of events, he calls for a ceasefire on their rivalry, realizing that it's gone too far. Plankton forgives him, and the next day, we see that they've become best friends again. They even start a partnership where they merge their restaurants into the Krusty Bucket, with Mr. Krabs giving Plankton the formula as an olive branch, and Plankton giving Mr. Krabs control of his technology. A pillar of success forms in their revived friendship, and a new era of fast food dawns on the Age of Man. Wow. That's really something. Yeah. If... if you thought for a moment that 
the writers would even attempt something this heartwarming and inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're giving them way too much credit. No, here's what actually happens. <gasps> really? He's a mess. <laughs> really? Do you want to have Mr. Krabs step on a kitty while you're at it? Maybe burn down an orphanage, because, let's face it, that's two of the things that come into your mind along with make fun of suicidal people when you think of things that only a despicably, insanely evil person would do. Ever. SpongeBob finally realizes that Mr. Krabs might not be that good of a guy after all, and tells Plankton that it's not actually a whale stalking him. He also tells him what Mr. Krabs' secret fear is, so he decides to get some revenge by trapping him and exposing him to a- Enjoy the show! No. No. No! Maybe make it stop! Wow. No wonder Mr. Krabs didn't want people to know what his secret fear was. Yeah, but it's pretty cool to see him get his comeuppance. Wait for it. If I were you, I wouldn't be so smug. Why not? Because a hungry pot of whales just showed up for its early feeding. <laughs> Get me out of here! <laughs> Woo! Glad well, you redeemed yourself, boy. Nope. I can't, I can't do this. Wrap things up, RL, I'm gonna go get a drink. Can you see why so many people hate this show now? It used to be imaginative, funny, and lighthearted. But over the years, all of that changed. It's replaced varied humor with uncomfortable cruelty, three-dimensional characters with annoying cliches, interesting visuals with gross imagery, and it's just been around for way too long. Yes, there are technically worse shows out there, but the reason why Spongebob's brought up so much is because there are so many different and insulting reasons why it's bad. Not to mention it really hurts a lot of people to see what was once one of the biggest shows in their lives reduced to something this uncomfortably awful. If you still like the show in spite of all this, okay. It would be unfair of us to judge people we don't even know based on that. But don't be surprised if you find that fewer and fewer people are agreeing with you. I'm the Rocket... No, no, I, I want a different name than that. Hey, GC, can I change my... GC? GC? Hey, man. What, what are you doing? Come look at this, Sean. Well, that's great. Steven Holmberg's coming back. M maybe they won't have to cancel the show. Maybe it'll get better after the second movie comes out. Yeah, but... What if it doesn't improve? Will I be able to tell if it's bad, or will I just accept it either way, like I used to with the modern seasons, just because it's Spongebob? You know all about the modern problems, Alex. We just made a whole video about... We did nothing. Talking about something we already know is one thing. Going into something new that may or may not have those problems is another. We need to go into this with both eyes open. Once started, there's no going back. Are you prepared to go all the way with this? Yes. Yes, I'm prepared to go all the way. My good friend. Good. Good. I knew I could count on you, Sean. What's going on here, then? Cut the internet connection, we leave. We've seen enough.